So Apple originally embraced this technology because NFC had really taken off on the Android platform. Um, they were investigating all kinds of payment opportunities, and they needed some kind of solution for, um, for uh, short communication mechanisms and for retail opportunities. Um, I've got a little video I'll show you in a bit. But um, before they embraced NFC, they were not exactly huge proponents of it. They seem to be now. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the uh, the iWatch, it, uh, the Apple Watch rather, it's very much um, uh, one of their flagship technologies in it. Um, so the iBeacon specification is a subset of the whole notion of Bluetooth beacons. So you've got Bluetooth beacons, you know, Android devices can have Bluetooth beacons, uh, Blackberries I guess, I don't know, who knows. Um, but iBeacon is Apple's certified protocol for uh, a type of Bluetooth beacon that they support. And they, their idea when it first came out was you will use this to trigger an app on your mobile device uh, when you arrive in a certain geographical location, whether that's in a store or a school or, or what have you. Now there's actually the, the, the notion of the beacon as a fixed point in space, though, is, is now becoming a bit more malleable. So there's a few more use cases than just that. Um, so, yeah, it was originally designed for people that go into a shop uh, and walk around and, and they're getting all kinds of different behaviors triggered on the shop's app, which is on your device. So imagine you walked into uh, a retail store and you walk into the clothing section and there's a beacon in there and you've got the store's app on your, on your phone. A little pop-up appears saying, hey, those clothes you seem to be interested in, half price today for you, just for you, buddy. So <laughs> you can see how you can use it as a, as a promotional sales opportunity. And of course, you get all kinds of metadata and feedback about how people are traveling around your store. You can see where they go and what they do. Um, so the two core concepts behind that are geofencing and microlocations. Microlocations are a way of really, really pinning down exactly where someone is, especially in an indoor environment where GPS is just not an option. Geofencing is a way of taking different areas and saying, do this in this location, this in this location, this in this location. Yeah? So for internal mapping, I mean, if you've got say, a school map, and you want people to see on this map where they are, you would geofence off those different rooms, and you might use beacons for that. And you can find keys with it. <laughs> so there's little devices that you can attach to your keys. They're just Bluetooth beacons. And if you lose your keys, you pick up your phone, you walk around, hot, cold, cold, hot, hot. Oh, there it is. OK. Ah, no one's tweeted yet. All right, we'll keep going. <laughs> All right, so what is the iBeacon specification? Uh, so it's a standard Bluetooth packet, and it's only one, and it's not even that big. It's pretty simple. You've got a header, the MAC address of the beacon, the data, and how strong the signal is. Nice and easy. The actual iBeacon frame itself is a prefix saying 
this is the iBeacon specifications. You've paid attention to me. If you're an iOS or OS X device or anything that recognizes iBeacons, there's no reason why an Android device can't um, recognize an iBeacon as well. There's a proximity U, uh, UUID. All that means is it's a big bloody long hexadecimal string that uniquely identifies um, the family of iBeacon that is being broadcast. I told you it'd be nuts and bolts. The major code usually identifies the type of device it is that the, that the, uh, the beacon is representing. So in this context, perhaps it's uh, uh, the major code is used to represent classrooms. A different major code would be used to represent uh, kitchens or restaurants. It's all down to your own individual use case and how you want to program them. The minor code usually represents a given entity. So um, you might have uh, one major code to represent um, classrooms and then a minor code representing an, an individual classroom. So in in beacon speak, any Bluetooth device pretty much can be a beacon, as long as it supports Bluetooth 4. There are a number of different kinds of beacon. Um, the Estimo was the first one that became really popular. Little wee plastic thing, um, just a little watch battery in it. You put them around the place. They're very unobtrusive. Um, then, of course, there are APNs, which also have Bluetooth. So if you've got, say, some of the latest Cisco devices, they can broadcast beacons as well. Some, I think there's a few Linksys models that do it now, too. Um, and there are some APNs which only act as beacons, and, and, and they get plugged in uh, in different locations. for They can broadcast multiple beacons at once. My favorite, which I've got a whole bunch of, and I deploy them for different events on my campus, are the Gem Tots. And they are very, very tiny. You know, They look just like those little micro uh, USB Bluetooth adapters you plug into your laptop. Um, just put them on a, power, a USB power adapter, plug them in at a given location. You broadcast multiple Bluetooth beacons. They're completely programmable. They also have a lot of data fields where you can extend it out if you really want to get creative. Um, uh, they're, they're very portable, so you can take them from location to location. I use them uh, at conferences at my university if there's like a, a specific app. Actually, I'll show you one in a bit. Um, or any device that supports Bluetooth 4 can um, be a beacon or see a beacon, um, including the Apple Watch, although I haven't got one, but if someone's got one, Loan it to me and I'll take it away and play with it. No, okay. So um, uh, Apple defined the iBeacon protocol. Any beacon it, or any Bluetooth device runs in two modes, peripheral and central mode, um, which I'll explain in a little bit. So it's, it's one direction, right? So the beacon is never being spoken to by the, re the receiving device. All it is is just broadcasting, just like a beacon that you might... Um, employ broadcasting light, that's not getting any information back. So it's a completely simplex transmission from the beacon out to receiving devices. And it's up to the device what they do with that, that knowledge that they're now in that location seeing that beacon. Um, it's all built on Bluetooth 4, so if you're Bluetooth 2, you're out of luck. You're not, your iPhone 4 is never going to see one of these things. And its whole job is to get the attention of some kind of device out there, right? So it's, it's a light, it's a, it's, um, it's a signal to do some action based on <clears throat> um, a, a given set of instructions and tasks programmed into the device. So all a beacon does is broadcast one frame. That's it, periodically. Boom, 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 that's it. Oh, here we go. How are you dealing with different platforms with beacons? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I deal with one platform, that's it. Um, I would imagine it's quite possible to, um, to create iBeacon functionality in any, any environment, but I haven't explored it. So these are the environments that I know support uh, iBeacons, although I don't know what you would do with iOS 5 and an iBeacon. <laughs> you probably want to get a bit more advanced than that. Um, so one of the nice things about iBeacons is they're built on Bluetooth for low emission technology. So very low power requirements. Yeah, a watch battery will power a beacon for a couple of years. So you don't have to run around changing the batteries in them all the time. Although I, that's one of the reasons I like the USB ones is even that is not a problem. Um, you can set it up so it emits very, very short bursts uh, every now and then or it's continuously broadcasting. But again, the power requirements are minimal even in 
its, its um, continuous broadcast mode. You can tell it uh, to have a certain range. So you can trigger behaviors on a device uh, at short range, medium range, or long range. So you can tell it, do something as soon as you see a beacon, or do something when you're mm, quite close to the beacon, or you've got to be bloody on top of it before I'll do anything, or, one, two, or all of those um, environments. Wi-Fi doesn't affect it, completely different frequencies. So you can be in a very noisy Wi-Fi environment, iBeacons will still work fine. Um, there's no bandwidth requirements really for it. So you can have multiple beacons in a room without um, any kind of saturation. This is just a single frame. And because there's no backwards and forwards communication, it, it is literally just a, a single broadcast. It's like a radio. Um, and beacons are only ever, you know what, I'm just repeating myself now. Let's get, let's get a move on. <laughs> So um, a, de a central device is a device that has some data to hand out in Bluetooth. You know, ah, this is boring. We're going to skip this bit. We can do better. All right, so here's an example of, a Bluetooth, of a, an iBeacon frame, that stranded long hexadecimal string. So anything broadcasting that with that prefix, that prefix identifies a specific iBeacon. Um, so it's saying, this is a beacon, an, uh, an eye beacon, not a standard Bluetooth beacon. Um, the proximity UUID is saying I'm an Estimote device. So um, Estimote is a company. They use this code to identify their devices. Uh, their major code, three zeros and an F. That can be entirely up to you what it means, but I'm, a, I'm on a fridge. And I'm on a fridge 23 is the minor code. So you put it on a fridge and you can find out. Um, so there's two different kinds of behavior in iOS 7 and iOS 8 for when um, iOS sees a beacon. Now, one of the cool things about iBeacons in iOS is that installing the app, uh, that the Beacon Aware app tells the OS to register that beacon. So you install an app on the device that's Beacon Aware, and it goes into a database in, in iOS of beacons that the operating system should look out for. So when the operating system sees the beacon, that triggers a behavior in the app. That app doesn't even need to be running, right? So the operating system sees a Bluetooth beacon, looks in its little database, says, oh, there's an app that's registered against that beacon. I'll wake it up. And I'll look in its, its notification list and see what it should do. So it can run background tasks. It can actually launch the app. It can send you notifications, even if you, uh, the app isn't running. And I don't mean the app's um, you, you home button out of the app and it's running in the background. I mean you can power down your device, load it back up, and then walk close to a beacon, and that will trigger the app. So that, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, um, it, it, it means that if you're in a store and someone hasn't run your app in, say, six months, it's still going to be triggered by seeing that beacon. That's just Bluetooth. All right, so um, I usually give a much longer... Uh, talk about Bluetooth and iBeacons to really bore people. So I'm skipping a lot of that. <laughs> so the tile is a really cool beacon. It's not an iBeacon, but this is the thing you put on your keys, right? It comes with an app. You install it on your, your iPhone, um, and then you, you can use it to just find things. That's all it does. It uses the, the power proximity information uh, that's being received via Bluetooth full low emission to tell you when you're getting closer and closer until it's there. Uh, yeah, the gem tots what I really like. You can buy them from passkit.com. You get a whole bunch of them for nothing. They'll even program them for you. So you can do it yourself using a really kludgy app. Or they, um, you can just say, please program my beacons using this major code and this minor code. And they'll send them to you with a little, um, little sticker to put on each one saying, all right, this is number one, this is number two. Really cool little company. Estimote are now making stickers that are beacons. So you no longer have to have these big bulky plastic um, things that stick out of walls can easily be pinched. Uh, these you can put on a poster. So here's a few little demos of how um, beacons have been employed in different locations. Uh, this, is, this is one I really like. This is... So this is... It's just... We don't need the music. This is a um, small museum in the Netherlands that have created their own app 
and you, you either install the app on your iOS device or you get one of the, the iPads they'll loan you for free. You wander around the different exhibits and as you get close, it triggers information about that particular exhibit. And it may pop up in the app a questionnaire. You know, Tell me about this person, here's some information about the artist, um, what did you think of this, what were your first impressions and experiences. Now, not only does this enhance the museum experience and give you, you know, a lot of contextual information about a piece of art you might not be aware of. It gives the museum a lot of information around which exhibits were really popular. You know, no one's stopping in this one, let's get rid of it and swap it out. But these ones, you know, they're uniformly popular, everyone really likes it, they interact with the app. So um, that is cheap to set up, the app is cheap to design. In fact, of course, a museum like this is always going to create uh, an app anyway. Enhancing it with beacons is, is just a, the logical next step. So this one is the standard shop model. So I believe, is this Macy's? I'm not sure. Yeah, it is, yeah. So Macy's is very much into the whole concept of beacons. Uh, there's a Macy's app. You install it on your phone. It knows who you are. You wander around. You get a bunch of points for actually entering the store. And, you know, it's, it's all just marketing and nonsense. But it, it is a very compelling, you know, if you're going to go to a department store, which one are you going to go to? You're going to go to the store which has just got a few signs up. You're going to go to the one which is generating credits and points for you as soon as you walk into the store and start browsing around. And because we are primarily from an educational context, I'll stop it. iBeacons in the classroom. So this fellow is an Australian um, teacher. Let's turn it up a little. Hopefully. Yeah, it's not that exciting. There we go, it went yellow. All right, that's enough of that. So um, I've, I've met that chap. He's a really nice guy, and the app is a lot better now. But <laughs> back then it was a hot, cold app. <laughs> I think you can do better. All right, so how could it be utilized in a classroom, this technology? Well, there's a number of different uh, thoughts that um, we've had in the past. Um, so a school map, right? You've got beacons all over the place. Uh, and you've got a complicated campus like this one. Um, so you're wandering around the campus buildings and the app is saying, well, you're right beside building blah. Um, if you want to go to, um, say, the Guthrie Lecture th Center, you need to take the next left and then head 300 meters north. Very handy. Um, so if you want to know uh, whether or not a device is in a room, well, this is a great, great use of that iPads can see beacons. iPads can trigger actions if they stop seeing a beacon. So if you've got a room with a beacon in it and you take in, and, and a trolley of iPads or iPods or whatever, and then that iPad leaves the, the range of the beacon, the iPad knows that. So it can perform some kind of action. A background cast be, can be triggered on the exit event. That means that it can say lock itself with a passcode. And that can be done by Casper because you're just loading a configuration profile onto it. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, attendance information, well, there's actually a couple of apps for that in the App Store. Um, people with BYOD devices in their pocket walk into a room, and the role is taken immediately. The device sees the beacon, it logs into a website, and, and, and says that person has walked in, and the role is automatically updated. There's an app called, what's it called? Be Here, I think. That, that does exactly that. And then the teacher can use it as well to um, communicate with people in the class and they can raise their hands and stuff. Uh, I haven't really played with it too much myself, but uh, people are looking at that kind of functionality. Um, so you can auto-configure a device based on walk, it walking into a particular classroom. So if you're operating a BYOD environment um, or you're handing out iPads in your institution, 
uh, you might want that device to be completely unrestricted, right? You want the, the kids to take that device home and use it as they see fit, but you want to maintain control over that in the classroom. So this is kind of like Casper Focus, where you, you want the, the education uh, professional in the classroom to have control of the device, but you don't want to apply any artificial restrictions on the device when it's not in the class. So someone brings in their device, as soon as it sees a beacon, Facebook becomes prohibited, you can't get into that website. Or it goes into single user mode, or, um, and, and, or single app mode rather, and it can't break out of the, the apps that are being used today in that classroom. Or because they're within range of the beacon. You want to turn off that behavior, as soon as the beacon is no longer being seen, those profiles come off. Uh, this, is, this is a cool one, which we use sometimes for events. Uh, geocaching and scavenger hunts. So if you've got um, a recruitment day on your campus like we often do, we put our beacons around the place and we, we create a little app that people can install on their devices and they wander around scanning for beacons and, and solving the clues they find in a given location. Um, if you've ever done any geocaching, this is a cool way to enhance that experience as well. Um, so, as we've seen, you can use it for um, telling people about a space they're in. So, if you've got, a, say, a lab with a certain number of computers in it, and there's a projector in the room, and a whole lot of cables and wires like this, you might want to have on, and on people's devices a pop-up appearing saying, all right, you're now in this room, this is the functionality available to you, here's some instructions, here's some YouTube tutorials for connecting your laptop to the equipment. Yeah or whatever. You know, if you've got some brilliant ideas, I'd love to hear yours. Do you, do you know of anyone that's actually, is that something you're doing? Uh, in a couple of rooms, yes. Okay. Uh, from a, a trial concept at the moment, but yes, we have, yeah, we have. Is that something we, it was initially suggested QR codes, but. Yeah, cool yeah, well, it's kind of the same thing yeah. to an extent. Um, QR codes have their place. I'm yeah. less of a fan of those than I am with this technology. Um, the problem with, with iBeacons is that a device is going to ignore them unless it knows to pay attention to a particular beacon. So it's very useful if you can control that suite of devices and have a specific yeah. app on there. Um, so we have that functionality via Casper. We can push it out to people's devices. But without that, for a lot of people, it's not going to be terribly useful for space dis discovery. Create a custom app. Yeah, yeah, quite right. Oh, here we go. Do I beacons work for machines with power nap enabled? I don't know what power nap is. What's power now? Um, so when you put your machine into sleep mode, um, you've got power, app, uh, power nap enabled, you can still get notifications of certain system events coming through. Are we talking about laptops, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't know because I'm very poor and I don't have a trolley of laptops. <laughs> but it would be <laughs> it'd be worth finding out. Yeah. You might be aware of the IV because like most people in the data the machine point can't do anything like that, so yeah. Yeah, although you might have something running in the background on it. I'll I'll show you a demo of that in just a bit. All right, so uh, let's play with some apps. Now what I really wanted to do is show you how we're using our JSS and iBeacons. Unfortunately, my JSS is running on port 8443, which is completely opaque to the network here, so I can't demo the policies and, and, and cool stuff we do with beacons. I can show you a couple of pictures. That's about it. But um, if you want to, so we, I'm going to try a little demo of this with anyone with an iPhone or an iPad. Um, they, can, they can have a crack as well. Um, now, to get this to work, you've got to have Bluetooth on. Uh, location services must be turned on. Passbook, which you may never use, uh, needs to be authorized to use location services. And you've got to have background app refresh on. You've got all the four of those things on, we can do a little, little test. And I'll be considering those criteria. I mean, with IT people, you often turn all that stuff off. Save a bit of battery, right? Um, <laughs> So maybe I'll get one person in 10 getting this to actually work, but we'll give it a try. So uh, I am going to play around with a little beacon called Dartle. Now, Dartle is an app. Uh, it's in the App Store. 
Um, it doesn't do much, but it's, <laughs> it's very useful for my purposes here because I can use, because it's just a, it's a simple transmit function, I can use it to trigger all kinds of different actions. So it's a good little demo app I use for a lot of things. So I've got Dartl installed. Uh, let's see, I'll just switch over to my phone here. I've got Dartle installed here. Nice, convenient little. Press the logo to start transmitting. Great. So, uh, to use Dartle, what I've got is I've got a little passbook business card. So, um, if you want to load up passbook on your device and scan the QR code that's uh, not on the screen yet, because I'm on the wrong one. Aha, yeah. Scan that. So a lot of people don't know that Passbook is um, iBeacon aware. The rationale for that is um, you arrive at an event and you want your ticket to automatically pop up. So you can make a Passbook ticket aware of, of, um, of someone arriving at a venue. So what I like to do with, um, with Passbook is I created a little business card. And if you scan that QR code in, in Passbook, it's, it's, it's not scanning? Let me zoom in a bit. Either we walk towards you or... <laughs> no, that's not working. How do we zoom in inside of here? Well, I'm... <laughs> control, you've got like the, I, the OS 10 control scroll. Is that zooming in? Uh, yeah, that's what I was... Yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah, quite right. Yeah, I'll do that. Tab. Say what now? It's an image, yeah, so just right click it, <coughs> open a new tab. Make a screenshot. Right, that's what I'll do. Open image, a new tab. Brilliant. Yeah, too many cooks in the kitchen, right? <laughs> All right, now I can zoom in on that bad boy. Okay. Is that big enough? You got it? Great. Oh my god, it's you. It's me, yeah. If you hit the little I in the, in the bottom right corner, you'll see all my contact details are in there as well. So the idea is people have now got my business card. Yeah, it's a very silly concept, but... Oh, yeah. So if you put your device to sleep at this point... Everyone got that? Yeah, all right. Let me just flip back to here. I'm going to start broadcasting a beacon. So I'm now broadcasting that Dartle beacon. If I flip back here, I've got a little iBeacon scanner application here. So if I start scanning, you can see that I'm broadcasting a beacon. So if you put your device to sleep and you turned on all four of those things, hopefully one of you, when you wake up your device, will see that Paul Cowan is nearby. Yeah, has someone got that? Yeah, great, there you go. So that's because the, um, the little credit card the, the little business card is registered with that Dartle beacon details. My idea is I'll get everyone to install these and then I'll arrive at a conference and I'll just start broadcasting that from my pocket and everyone will get a little pop-up going, ooh, go find Paul. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, very silly, but... All right, stop broadcasting. So that's one use, one very pointless use. So there is, if you want to see something, I'm not going to um, play around with this one because it tends to flake out a little bit, but there is an app called Near. Now Near is an iOS app that you can uh, install and you can set up actions inside it. So uh, if you've got two devices um, and you want to play around with triggering actions on one iOS device for another one, you just set up an action in Near, then on the other device you start broadcasting a Near beacon and uh, it will do that thing on the other device. So if you want to, uh, a, a very quick and dirty demo of iBeacons triggering actions on another device or multiple devices, Near is a good way to do it. And it's just in the App Store. B here is that um, uh, class enrollment thing I was talking about before.
So it tells the teacher who's in the classroom. People can use their devices to raise their hand. And of course it gives you role information, who's actually entered the room. What kind of music is that? Silence you, all right. So another fun one to play with if you're interested in this technology. Now, there is an app called, uh, an a development environment called Bicondo. Um, and Bicondo is very compelling if you want to start making your own iBeacon aware contextual apps. Because all this stuff is very cool on your mobile device, but it's not much use for you if all you've got access to is near and data, right? You need the ability to develop something for an event or for your faculty or your institution. So um, what, what I like to do is I use Bicondo because it can, uh, it can create outputs in two places. It can create um, uh, an output which goes into the Bicondo viewer, which is an app store environment which you download. So you create your Bicondo project in the Bicondo tools. Then you load it in the viewer. And at that point, you've got a fully functional app. Or you can export out of Bicondo into an Xcode project and continue your app development in there. So it gets you 95% of the way to um, uh, a Beacon Aware uh, event app, and then it takes you in to, into Xcode where you can do the last 5% of coding and compiling and make it into something that can be even put in the App Store. So um, I've got a little app called M Learning Day. So we run an event called M Learning Day every year at the university. I ran one last year. Um, let me just show it to you. Hopefully I've got it on here. Here we go. So M Learning Day 2014. This was built entirely in Bicondo. It's a pretty simple app. Uh, I've got my program, which goes to a Google Calendar, which it occurs to me will now be nearly a year in the past, so I'm not going to see a lot there. Uh, the latest news from the conference. Uh, you can tweet the conference. You know, why are these loading? There we go. Hello, welcome to Twitter. Great. So there's some kind of problem with um, the network here, I guess. Conference Wi-Fi information. Of course, this is all beacon aware, um, all of this functionality. Yeah, the program's gone. So this was, this was all built entirely in Bicondo. It was very um, uh, hit and miss in terms of getting people to install it. But um, it did work very well with the iBeacon functionality. Parking information. Um, so if we very quickly have a look at Bicondo on, on the Mac. So this is Bicondo itself. These are the, the um, simple tools you use to create it. It's got this concept of screens and pages. Um, you simply create the number of screens you want, then you, you fill it with content. And there's this list of beacons here. So I've got a number of different, these are all my gem tots that I use back home, the little wee USB things. You can see I've got different minor codes for each one. That means trigger a different action on, on each of these individual beacons. So if I look at what I've got this one triggered to do, this one says as soon as you see it, so the range is far, open a website, that website being uh, my university website, and load page beacon five. Um, and also play a little sound. And do it every time they come within range, not just once. So a quick and dirty demo of um, Bicondo working. Now, for the M Learning Day app, because I wanted to deploy it through the App Store to people, I exported it out of Bicondo into Xcode. But for this one, which is just a little quick demo, I've got only a single beacon. And that is, once again, a Dartle beacon. I'm not suggesting any kind of major or minor code. I'm simply saying, as soon as you see something, a beacon from the Dartle company, do, a, do an action. The action I've got here is say hello, Xworld. And uh, I have a very simple screen, which is just a map. Not very complicated. And when I exported it, I exported it into the Bicondo viewer. If I flick back to my little phone here, I've got a little app on here called Bicondo. If I go inside it, you can see I've got the viewer. Well, that obviously works. <laughs> you can see I've got the viewer application here, which loads a map. If I, using this one, load Dartle and 
broadcast. There we go. So I get a little pop-up message. Or it could load another app, or it could take me to a website, or it could do just about anything. Unfortunately, I've got too many actions on this device triggered by a data beacon. So whenever I turn that thing on, it, a whole lot of stuff happens. Yeah, so if, even if you're not a coder or a developer, you can pretty cr quickly create beacon-aware apps using this technology. It's a lot of fun. Great fun to play with. So if you want to play around with the mLearning Day app, you can download it from um, that location. This is all available in the, the slides. These slides are all online. So Now, unfortunately, uh, at this point, I'd love to give you a demo of using Casper for management. Um, but unfortunately, with my JSS unavailable, I can't deploy the policies even when this Mac sees the trigger. So um, what I can do is show you the app I like to use. Uh, it's called, where is it? Here we go. Big Beacon Boss. Right. So this is just an app. Uh, all it does is broadcast one of four beacons. These are four things that I like to do when I'm in front of one of my academics computers. Um, Starting a root terminal access session. Well, none of, none of my staff are administrators on their devices. But sometimes I'll be working with them and I need access to an administrator terminal. The terminal, because they, you know, they don't really need access to that, is restricted from their user context. What I can do is I can load this app up on my phone, hit that button, their device um, sees the beacon. The Jamf binary is registered with that beacon. It's, it's in the JSS. The JSS has a list of beacons, and it knows to keep an eye out for that one. And it goes away and triggers a policy. That policy is a simple script saying, load the terminal application uh, using root. So from my point of view, I push that button, and up appears on the screen on their computer uh, a terminal session running root. Um, report hardware details, it just does a jam freak on. So um, if I need to do inventory on a device, there you go, it's reporting. Uh, auto configure ARD, uh, really that's restart the Kickstarter. So if ARD has crashed on someone's machine and I need, and I need someone in my office to remote in, I can just push that button and it, it restarts the whole thing. Load the password changer, we have a proprietary application for changing Active Directory passwords to avoid all that keychain nonsense. I want to encourage people to um, to use that rather than any other method, mechanism of changing their password. So um, we have that available in Casper self-service, but I can walk up to someone's computer, hit that button, and it'll load for them. So if someone's asking me, hey, Paul, how do I change my password? Use that, click. It's kind of a cool little demo. Um, so you can use Casper to lock devices when they leave a classroom. That's a very useful application if you've got a trolley. Right? especially if the beacon is in the trolley. So they can be locked. If you've got corporate data on a device and it no longer sees a beacon, then perhaps you don't want that to be any accessible anymore until the beacon is available again. Um, performing authorized admin functions, where we've just seen it. Uh, well, you didn't see it, but you know what? I'm actually still showing my phone. Um, so you can do all kinds of administrative functions just with a beacon. From an IT administrator point of view, that's very useful. You know, your, your imagination is anything limiting you and what you can do with these beacons. Um, yeah, they do work. <laughs> In fact, I should be able to give you a bit of a, a demo of some functionality here. Uh, I'll show you that one in a minute. What I can do is, if I just skip out here. So I've got, um, uh, I can't show you a Casper policy running. But I have got uh, this little guy, Beacon Launcher. So Beacon Launcher is a little app you can download. I think it's made by Two Canoes, uh, a, great, a great company that do good work with iBeacons. So this one is just set up to, once again, keep an eye out for a Dartle beacon. And if it sees it, do something. So I'll just unmute this. Hopefully we've got audio now. So all I'm doing now that this is running, is, is hopefully running that little say script if it sees this. That's a Darnell beacon. There we go. So you can um, add exit events as well. So you can have it do different functionality. That's a cool little demo of, of 
how you can manage Max, because basically if you can run a script, you can do pretty much anything. Um, but it's not terribly useful to have giant GUIs running on people's computers in the background. So um, to get around that, we, uh, there is a tool called Proximity D, which has just come out from Two Canoes for doing exactly, uh, for, for running scripts in the background. Uh, I've tried it, it doesn't really work too well. I wrote my own a little while ago called, that's not it, uh, here we go, Button Masher. So Button Masher is a little binary that scans for um, different actions that occur. So what I've got Button Masher doing in this context is, if I just run this here. Right, so it's now currently running in the background. I could be doing this, it's telling me why I launched Daemon. That's the way I should be running, I shouldn't be in the terminal window. All it's doing is monitoring for beacons at the moment, it's specifically for beacons. And it, the triggers I've got encoded in the binary are push um, specific buttons and send specific keyboard events on seeing specific beacons. Now, my rationale for doing that is um, quite often if you're giving slides, uh, slideshows like this, um, you want to be wandering around the room and you want to be able to remote control your slides. Um, now, wireless networks like this one, it, one, one of the usual ways you do that is to run something like Keynote Remote on your, on your iPhone if you don't have access to a cool little RFID wand. Um, so you run Keynote Remote or some other app, but that requires it to be on the same wireless network as the device you're running the slides from. If you're um, very brave, you can do it over Bluetooth, um, to your laptop, but what if you're presenting from an iPad which doesn't support um, specific uh, Bluetooth devices like mice and keyboards for slide transitions, or you just are having trouble pairing the devices for whatever reason, you know, you can't remember the pin code. Beacons don't require any pairing. So if you're broadcasting a beacon and your device is seeing that beacon, you can do slide transitions um, via that locally running binary, which can be running all the time as a launch daemon, completely in the background. So let me show you what I mean. If I load up, I've got my little, where are we? A little app here called Beacon Play. All it does is broadcast two different kinds of beacons. So left and right arrow keys. Let's give it a try. So if I flick back to my slides here, I zip up here. In theory, because that binary is now running, if I hit the button, There we go. So I, it, I just tap the button on my phone, it broadcasts a beacon, and I get slide transitions. So no pairing, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. I'm just broadcasting beacons and transitioning through my slides. So that, it, that binary is completely configurable. I can have it triggering any action I want. I don't have to even create my own app on the phone. I could use any beacon transmitter software like Dartle to trigger that action. So you can be playing around with this stuff almost immediately from your own context. And it allows you to wander around triggering actions via Casper, policies, profiles, pushing them out to iOS devices, R6 devices, you know, whatever you need to do to make your life a little easier or automate something about one of the people you support's lives, you can do using this technology. You don't actually have to buy the beacons first. You can play around with all these apps. So, questions? Well, I'm actually finishing a bit early. Normally my, uh, normally my talk uh, requires a bit of time playing around in the JSS, but uh, unfortunately I can't even load that. Well, you keep on mentioning for, uh, things from a security point of view, like um, lock it to a particular room. Is it not possible just to scan the beacon ID that's broadcasting and then just rebroadcast it yourself? Or is there any other sort of security involved? Yeah, so if you want to scan for beacons, anyone, they're, they're, they're completely um, visible to everybody. So if I load my little beacon scanner here. Yeah, so could I just rebroadcast those UUIDs and then I'll just replicate the beacon? Sure, absolutely, yeah, you can. But first you'd have to know what actions they triggered. right? So yes, anyone can, can broadcast a particular beacon. Now there, there are ways, I believe, to um, add a bit more contextual information. So maybe you have um, uh, in your binary, which, which does a specific thing, 
it looks at the minor code, and the minor code might be altered based on some kind of timestamp by running it through an algorithm. So um, if you're using the correct app to broadcast the beacon, it's broadcasting a specific minor code that's got some kind of hashing going on. That same hashing algorithm is employed in the binary, and there's a comparison that takes place. So it's not the same beacon every time, but both of them are running an algorithm which allows them to figure out whether or not it should be accepting that as a legitimate beacon. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be static like this one. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Does it actually run twice? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so one of the cool things about beacons is that um, you've got two events, exit and entry. So do something as soon as you see a beacon and stop doing a thing, uh, uh, do something when you no longer see it. In Casper, that's the, there's one trigger for that called beacon state change. So it doesn't really see entry or exit events. Uh, it just says... Uh, do this action whenever I can see or no longer see the beacon. Now, there is a way you can get some level of customization around that using limitations and exclusions, uh, although the, the binary really does need to accept exit and entry events to really um, be powerful. But um, So your question is basically, can um, you stop the event happening again and again and again, right? Yeah, but like if there are two lecture theaters like this side by side. Yeah. Yeah. In both lecture theaters, you know, um, and the, we've got a policy that says, um, you know, perform, uh, get the jam binary to immediately perform check in, right? Yeah, you don't want to do it twice. Right. So at that point, the first action, so there's some kind of binary going on processing that action or a policy that's running from Casper. The first thing you could do is say, turn off Bluetooth. So an action's been triggered, I don't want to do anything else until this is run and done. And then at the end of it, you could, you could include some kind of um, command as a timeout saying, don't do this again for another 15 minutes. You know, some kind of system flag you'd set. So not directly through beacons, but yes, programmatically through the thing that's triggered on the beacon. You can, you can manipulate your way around all that kind of problem. I know exactly what you mean, but it's, um, it's less of a barrier than you might think. Indeed. Yeah, I can show you an example of that. If I load up this Darcel environment again. Here we go. So it's currently searching for beacons. If I load the same app on this device and start transmitting. That's a Darcel beacon. Oh, shut up. <laughs> so you can see currently that little circle there shows the range of the beacon. If I go all the way over here, Well, I'm still in medium range. It's, the range is about 70 meters, so I guess I could throw. <laughs> but if I slowly get closer and closer and closer, you can see the proximity changes. You can set up different triggers based on proximity rather than just, I see a beacon, I don't see a beacon. Yeah? So I can go all the way down to, here we go, that's a bit more information. So as I get closer and closer and closer, you can get really precise, you know, right on top of it. Mid-range now. So it can be a, a pad that you tap your device on in order to trigger an action, rather than just you walked into a room and maybe you're seeing another beacon across the way. Any other questions? No? So that's reasonably clear? Okay, I guess I'm finishing early. Right. Thanks, Thanks a lot.